Okay, welcome to the second part of lecture uh, of lecture two in um, in our in our discussion on classical bioinformatics, and then let's go to the um, uh, uh, the Smith Waterman. You know that was part of the homework, but uh, I'm glad some of you showed the due diligence and uh, and uh, picked up the mistake that I made in one of these in one of these terms. I'm going to leave it as a mistake rather than rather than fix it because uh, you know, there's a little bit of an expectation of diligence. Okay, so let us now go to the second part again as you see and that is what is called the fast A format. Now the fast A format is a is a is, is, is pretty critical. It's it's in the sense that if you wanted to submit a a uh, you know to a sequence for a blast search or or a resource that actually processes the information, uh, you know, whether it's a protein sequence or a DNA sequence, it doesn't matter. And, um, uh, but, you know, it's pre required that you submit it in the FASTA format. Now, granted, uh, most current uh, resources will be able to process your information without, without having to, uh, you know, any particular format because the, 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 the software on the server side where the processing takes place will will pick up the information and and translate it accordingly, okay, and into the into a format that is that is required by that particular software. However, uh, it's still important to know what a fast A format is. So this is fast and A. Uh, this is not to be confused with fast and Q, which is what we will be doing when we do our our discussion on on next generation sequencing and the genomics applications of bioinformatics. Okay, so the FASTA format is the is is what you see in in front of you right right here. So again, the information about the sequence, the length is not important, but the length has to be 80 characters long. This is very very important because you can see here. Uh, so let's say as you can see that's 80 characters. So let me go go back one step. Now the first line of a of a particular sequence and you can have millions of these in the same file and the file can be called fna fsa fas dot fasta you know any of these uh, uh, the software will will be able to understand what the format is so the first line is begins with this caret this greater than sign and then that's just information about that particular sequence now what the software will do is anything that follows this particular greater than sign it's just going to pick up and reproduce in the result. It's not going to process it. Uh, you know, there are some software which, which kind of get are restricted to how long you can make this. Now, this particular length can be as long as you want. It doesn't really matter. It's not part of the processing. The really the real processing takes place at the, uh, uh, at the sequence level. Okay. So remember, you don't. This can be as long as you want. You can put any kind of information in you want in this line. Which is uh, related to you know information that you're trying to produce to pre uh, to create okay any kind of any kind of information you need is fine as long as you want okay now the sequences that are here have to be 80 characters long okay and then you go to the next line and you continue and that's the correct format of the fast day if you put in a bunch of characters which go beyond 80 the software is not going to pick it up okay. And so what I typically do is to make sure I have 80 is I just do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I cut and paste. I cut and paste this to up to 80. And then I know that I'm typing in the correct. Now what happens if you have, if you have fewer than 80? If you have fewer than 80, then it's okay. The moment, moment the software finds an empty space, it's going to go to the next line. And again, it's not a good idea to leave empty spaces in your FASTA format. You know, if you want to, if you there is a gap, for example, and we've we've looked at our discussions on gaps, you will find that that you can just put a dash and that'll that'll take care of it. Okay, all right. So 80 characters. All right. Now we are looking at what is called as as the other the other part of classical bioinformatics, and that is what is called the translating. Okay. So you have your DNA sequence or your mRNA sequence, it doesn't really matter. If you put it in a piece of software, it'll translate it, whether it's T or U, it doesn't really matter. It's just going to think of it as you know, T and U as interchangeable. Okay, and so what you see here is you have a, 
you have uh, your codons, right? So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and the translation takes place in the first frame. So you see that TAG translates to whatever, ATC, TAG, ATG, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now what you can also have is translation in the second frame where it's the same sequence as before, right? It's the same sequence as before. It's just that that you, s you, you kind of ignore the first nucleotide and then you've got, you've got your codons established this way. And that's how the translation takes place, okay? You can also translate in the third frame by ignoring the first two, ignoring the first two nucleotides and translating from there. And this is actually pretty crucial. It's not just because the frame shift is, a, is an important consideration in, in protein translation. So these are just instances of information just for your knowledge. Now you could also do the reverse first frame, okay? In the reverse first frame, we begin to translate in this direction. Okay, like so. Then there's a reverse second frame where you ignore the C and then translate. This is the same sequence. And again, you can you can put the sequence in, in a, and I'll show you what that translate uh, system is, and then you can go from there. Okay, and then you can also reverse translate in the in the third frame. Okay. Now there is a is is called a translate software expasy, which is really useful, and you can you can um, process that information, you can process that information, um, and, and we, we'll go to that web page. Now the, f the face page of the web page might have changed, so let's just go to uh, translate on XPACI. And it's one of the most uh, popular of the popular sites. And so let's go to that, the XPACI translate to. So let me go to the let me go to the, so this is the resource, so let me go to the web, and you can see here, just, just type XPACY translate in Google or any of your searches, and it should be fine, and so we will go and, and translate the sequence, and so there's all ways, you know, where you have uh, verbals, which means that a methionine, which is your start codon, is identified as such. Uh, spaces between residues, uh, you know, it can include the nucleoside sequences, all kinds of information. And then you can remember how I showed you it's the forward and reverse. So let's take the entire, entire process, okay? So let's take our sequence. Um, let's take our sequence, the one which we, we looked at, and you can see how that, how that translation, uh, that translation takes place in the, um, in the web. Okay, so let's see how that translation takes place. So this is the sequence that I, I started out with. Nothing complicated, really simple. And then I'm going to translate it. And then you see the results of the translation, right? So it says, so the first frame is very important because it starts with a stop codon. So immediately that's like a nonsense translation, right? A nonsense, a nonsense mutation, sorry. Okay, then you have an isoleucine, then another stop codon, and then it translates, it translates correctly, but again, this is not a useful. However, you'll see that if you, if you translate that sequence it, from the second frame, you get a completely different protein sequence. And this is very critical, okay, it's very critical. So here's another one. And then you look from the three prime to five prime, you see the translation, uh, the translation taking place, okay, and you see that um, this is a reverse translation, and then in this case you have a stop codon when you do the frame shift, again this is all reverse translated, reverse translated, and then, so you'll see that the, 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 this notion of the frame shift translation, the frame shift mutation, basically results in completely different proton, uh, uh, results in completely different proteins. Uh, there is a, uh, so that, okay, that is, uh, is, is very critical. Now, I will, uh, I will give you a, a short uh, uh, kind of an anecdote of, of why this is important, and it resulted in a, it resulted in a paper for us. Uh, so there was a, so I deal uh, with, you know, olfactory receptors. For example, you can see, this is, uh, this is an olfactory receptor is an olfactory receptor 
and uh, and this is uh, it kind of through the computational biology of olfactory receptors and i i have um, you know and i do protein modeling of uh, olfactory receptors and computational studies that arise from that and so i was uh, asked by somebody to, to, to work on a model of a protein sequence that, that they had. And, you know, I, I looked at it and they said that it's, it's a functional protein, it's perfectly fine. They have done experimental analyses on this protein, so, so you know, that means it's functional, it's not a pseudogene with any kind of nonsense mutations which kind of renders the protein. Um, and so when we got that the nucleotide sequence, we said, okay, let's find you know what the protein sequence is, so let's translate it. And we translated it, and immediately we get a whole bunch of stock codons, a whole bunch of stock codons. And it's like, well, stock codons, that doesn't make sense. So we asked them, what is going on here? And, the, and our collaborators weren't able to tell us exactly what the problem was. And so, so we said, okay, well, we'll, we'll see. And then, then one of my students was working, and we just said, let's, let's put it in translate and see what happens. And sure enough, the second frame shift translation. And the second frame shift translation gave you a functional protein. Now, when we looked at the when we looked at the the, the structure, they said that the structure was was very anomalous. There was something novel about the structure that was not found in in typically other structures. And this is uh, this is very important because because you know we we um, we wouldn't have figured this out if not for this translate. Okay, uh, and so we actually discovered an olfactory receptor, you know, a membrane protein in the, in the nose, which has a completely different, um, a completely different uh, structure. And now we talked about olfactory receptors. I showed you the web page that I developed that did all the genome, genome level olfactory fam uh, receptor families. And so, and so we found something, something very novel, something very anomalous, but yet functional. And then we finally talked to a, a geneticist and they said, oh yeah, yeah, they knew about this thing. They, they called it a functional pseudogene. And now we actually using this process, we figured out that it was what gave it its functionality was translation in the second, in the second, uh, in the second frame. Mo more importantly, you'll also realize that not only was it the translation in the second frame, a goodly number of the statistical genetics uh, geneticists told us that they projected that a goodly number of people had this particular sequence at, at this particular olfactory receptor as pseudogenic, okay? But a few, a few people had it, that particular receptor functional. And so they said, well, what? Because in, in some cases, from an evolutionary standpoint, you see that in some cases, some of these receptors um, are, are, are pseudogenic, but it's possible that they would be pseudogenic, but once in a while there's a frame shift mutation which actually renders the protein functional, but that just happens in, in a certain part of the population. And so this, is, this opened a whole bunch of really interesting notions as to kind of the nature of the evolution of olfaction. Okay, so that was an interesting, but again, it is, it is, this, uh, it is this tool which uh, which uh, rendered this information um, which rendered this information for us uh, that, 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 that basically resulted in a, in a paper and we did a whole bunch of additional work that arose from this. All right, let's look at some basic definitions of what is called an open reading frame. Uh, an open reading frame is a continuous stretch of codons you know, which basically is a translatable region of a DNA sequence, an mRNA sequence, which starts with a star codon. And so, and an ORF is a continuous stretch of codons that do not contain a stop codon. It's called codon, it's TA, UA, UGA, UAG, and UAA. And a, an ORF, or maybe defined as a region, is specified minimum size between two stop codons or between a start codon and a stop codon. So basically a definable, region of translated protein, can't, can't really say whether it's functional because that's a little downstream, is, a, is an open reading frame. Okay. All right, let's look at in terms of the genetic code. You've got the first letter, UCAG, and then you have a UCAG here, and then you will see that you have all these UUs, UCs, UAs, and then UCAG. And so you'll see that 
this is how the how the genetic code translates. It was discovered by a, a, a scientist called Harovind Purana, who basically translated the genetic code. And so you have, and it started with uh, you know a lot of lysines, multiple lysines, because lysine, as you can see, uh, is basically AAA. So uh, alanines in a row, uh, alanines in a row, basically gave you lysines. So this 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 it, it kind of started there, but this. It's a very, very, uh, very, very elegant, uh, very, very elegant logical way in which they figured out the genetic code. Okay, so this is genetic code. There are other ways to look at it. You know, this is the first letter, second letter, and then the third letter, and it tells you which of these. And notice there's a redundancy, right? So there's a redundancy in in these. So, for example, you know, more than one nucleotide gives you a lysine. More than one gives you an R uh, gives you. Uh, you know, all of these are, are multiple, right? And then, you, of course, you have the UAG, UGA is a, is a stop codon, the UAA is a stop codon. There's another representation of it. It gives you the same result, which tells you what the resulting, uh, resulting amino acids are. And here is a third, here's another one, and that one gives you not just that, it actually helps you a little bit with, with the resulting structures. Okay, let's look at what a a blast search is. So a blast is what is called a basic local alignment search tool. So that's an acronym, right? So the B-L-A-S-T. And it's probably one of these things that even undergraduate under, undergraduate students learn. Now, again, and this, so the, the same fundamental notions that we look at in terms of our algorithms, uh, you know, the Smith, Waterman, the Needleman, Wunsch, uh, are incorporated into these blast searches. And so, uh, of course, it's all automated. You don't have to think about it. And this is one of the reasons why the homework and those and those four or five slides which taught you about recursive relationships and choosing the max of recursive relationship to be able to generate the rest of the sequence. Now, of course, when you automate something like this, when you write a, 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 a an, an algorithm, then it's a little easier because um, it, it's a little easier in the sense that you don't have to worry about time, you don't have to worry. Still, however, when you go to those blast things, depending upon how busy their servers are, it will, um, it, it, it takes a bunch of time. Now, there are different kinds of blasts, okay, and I think it's important to understand which those are. There is blast P, okay, which compares, and so what, what blast does is, you know, one of the reasons why it has, it's so efficient, but it's also comprehensive and, you know, therein lies a little bit of a challenge in, in, in using it is because it basically searches kind of like a pairwise alignment against every known every known um, nucleotide etc sequence in 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 blast right this is now probably measuring in the several billions um, or even you know trillions so what does blast p does blast p basically you you give it a protein sequence and it's going to blast it or do a alignment against a database of proteins blast n so blast p and blast n are the typically the most are the most uh, popular ones you know you have a nucleotide sequence you need to know what else is in there and it compares against the database of nucleotides then you have blast x so what blast x does and this is goes back to where we looked at the the, 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 the six frame translation, the, 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 the frame shift, the frame shift translation that takes place. So here, what does Blastex does? Is that it compares a six frame conceptual translation of a nucleotide. So basically what it does is it takes a nucleotide sequence, it does the, it, uh, it uh, translates it in six frames, that is three forward, three reverse, right? First frame, the typical nucleotide, then a frame shift, the second sh uh, frame, the frame shift, and another frame shift, and then it reverses it and does a you know the, the sequence as is, and then a frame shift to translation. So now what happens is you have one sequence, right? And therefore now you have one sequence, but you have six different six different potential proteins that arise from it, and and uh, then it compares it against a protein. Okay, against the protein database. So then what happens is it has a six times higher blast P. That's blast X. Then you have a T blast N, which compares a protein sequence against a nucleotide sequence, conceptually translated in all. So now it, if you take a protein sequence, it takes a protein sequence 
and then it conceptually translates everything that is all the nucleotides in the PLAS database. So you can see what a, what a tremendous process this is, and then it does a comparison. Then you've got the TBLASTX that takes a nucleotide sequence, converts it into six, right, the six-frame translation of a nucleotide sequence, and then compares it with a six-frame translation of nucleotide in the nucleotide database. So you can see the see the number of comparisons that takes place, right? It's it's now it becomes exponential. And then you have a side blast, and the side blast is called a position-specific iterative, is an iterative process that creates a generic profile of closely related proteins and recursively does this before comparing it to a protein database. So what it does is it, it basically takes takes um, uh, takes closely related proteins and then it it does a um, it creates a generic consensus profile of what that family looks like and then it does and compares it to a protein database so this is when there are distantly related sequences this is when you get essentially essentially nothing from your <laughs> from a typical blast search so so now we look at BLAST, and we'll basically take a small sequence and run it. And one of the important aspects of BLAST is what is called, and people often forget this, is what is called the E-value, or the expectation value. Now, typically what happens when you run a BLAST search, you, you have your, your sequence, and then you take that sequence and you compare it against a bunch of sequences, right? Now, because of the, the statistical kind of the... Um, kind of an ensemble comparison against so many, there is a chance that a particular comparison, compared a good hit happens at random, okay? And so what the E value tells you is, it's a, it's a value that tells you that what is the chance of that particular match being at random, okay? Random in the sense that statistically it happened, but it's not necessarily statistically crucial. Okay, that's the E-value, which means that if you have a low E-value, it means that the probability of, of this match being equal, the, this, the probability of this match being just some random match that just happened is very low, right? E-value, so E-value. So low E-value means you have a greater validity of your of your comparison. Okay, so let's um, let's go to a blast search, and we can see what we can do with that. And so let me go back to my home page. And typically, uh, typically you can go and look for you know just do NCBI blast, and you will see your NCBI blast in your search engine. And so this is. And it actually tells you all of these, you know, standard protein blasts. So let's just go to a nucleotide blast, and you'll see now there are all kinds of things you can put. You can put a FASTA sequence, just a regular sequence. You can put your your accession numbers. Accession numbers is the GenBank accession number. You can put the GI, which is a unique identifier. And typically you'll find a, and I'll show you what that unique identifier is, because even, because a program knows exactly what sequence is associated with that identifier, what sequence is associated with it. So let us go to um, the sequence that we originally picked up, FASTA formatted sequence. Sorry. And, and go from there. So I'm going to enter the sequence I originally had, and it's a, just a blast. I'm just going to do the nucleotide, nucleotide just to show you. And then you can see here there is a nucleotide uh, thing. You, know, you can compare it against an rRNA, genomic transcript databases, beta coronavirus, experimental databases, nucleotide. Now here, you can say I want only human. I can add, I want only a human, but let's not worry about it. Enter the organism, the common name, the binomial name, and then it says, so if I want only human, I want to take that mouse sequence, and I go to human and like homo sapiens, so let me just go with, so just go to human, 
F9600 in the taxonomy ID. And that's all I want. And now if on the other hand, I, if I click this button, it says uh, I want to exclude humans. And we don't want to exclude humans because we just want humans. Now you can add other organisms to and to create a list. Now I'm not interested in any of these other things. You see, you can, you can, um, how you can create a custom database, etc. And we're just looking for highly similar sequences or more dissimilar sequences, somewhat similar sequences. So there's, you know, there's a blast n component is here. So let's just go with the mega blast component, but it's still nucleotide versus nucleotide. Okay. And now it, uh, you know, it takes a time, and you can see this, uh, this happen in real time. So. Uh, as an aside, uh, you know, th they always suggest that, that do this in the morning, do it at night. If you have a blast search where you expect large amounts of results, don't do it during, you know, during, uh, during the daytime when, 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 it, when the servers are very busy, okay? And so we see, so we see these results. So let's, let's process these results. It, it, it took place pretty quickly. So we said all we wanted was humans, okay? So you can see that you have, this is a human. Now this is just a complete, a complete 19 chromosome, okay? So that particular thing was found in the chromosome, but I don't want that, I just want your typical mRNA, okay? So this is, the, all of it is found in chromosome 19, you know, the complete, the complete CDs. And so you will see here that there is the, the maximum alignment score, okay? The maximum alignment score, the total score, what kind of coverage, like what part of the, that that particular sequence was covered. You see the E values, the E values are very, very low, 10 to the negative 100 and something, which means the chances of it being a prob you know, probability is very less. What is the percentage identity in the map? Okay, so it aligned it with something. Of course, there's gonna be gaps, there's gonna be mismatches. We, al we already understand how those are. And so how much percentage of it mapped and you know, then there's the length of the sequence of it. This is the chromosome, so it's going to be what is it, six six billion, whatever nucleotides, right? Six uh, six hundred and seventeen million uh, nucleotides. So that's the entire chromosome. We're not worried about that. That that's going to be a mess to look at. And then you have the other actors. Now, if you scroll down, you'll see. You know, you can you can ask it for the first hundred matches. But let's go to just one, like a like an mRNA, right? So I click on that, and it takes me to the GenBank. It takes me to the GenBank entry. Okay, and so that's the GenBank entry. It says, so this is, it, it found a very good match. Okay, so it tells you what the journals are. Uh, this is Linda Buck. She was the one who won the Nobel Prize in 2004. Uh, so they found this, uh, you know, all kinds of interesting information, the genes, how it basically, you know, how it, how they put it together from that gene by excluding out the, the exon uh, and things like that. And so you have, uh, you have the protein sequence here, okay, you have the protein sequence of that particular, whatever it compared to, and, uh, you know, it tells you all the matches to all the sequences, and here's your DNA sequence to which it matched, okay. Uh, so the nucleotide sequence. So this is uh, so you you this is the result this is the result you find now let's go back to our blast results okay and you'll see what are we looking for here we are looking for uh, the graphic summary okay the graphic summary if you click on that it'll tell you almost like high matches and then you have the so you, there's a color code. The color code says that red means very strong matches, black means less than 40 alignment score. So you'll see that these are within 80 to 100, and then there are some sequences. So they are all, they are all um, scored based on, on the quality of the match. If we go back to the description, you will see that towards the end, towards the bottom, you will see that, yes, this is still statistically pretty sound, but the percentage identity is very small, and that can be seen in your, in the graphic, in the graphical summary, right? So most of the top hits are, are good solid matches. Now you can actually go to the alignment, okay? And this is the chromosome 19. You can see the alignment that takes place. And again, to click on that, you have to click on alignment, okay? And 
I'm not going to worry about the taxonomy because we chose just humans, so if you know exactly what the taxonomy is, you can go to the NCBI and find it out. And so you will see that the, the line, these vertical lines, the pipes as they would call them, show in that chromosome from like the, so this is query sequence, right? And this is what number is, so this is that, that, so it's 14 million, 969,090 to 14,968,572, okay, that, that's where it extends to, and you can see the alignment, you can see there are mismatches, it introduces gaps here, so there's a mismatch, and whenever there is a match, you will see that there is a, is a straight line, so that's one way to look at it, okay, so you will see that there's results this way too, so you can see exactly what that match is. Now, one of the other things you could do is you can just say, I want a percentage identity of 95 to 100, and I can filter that way, okay, and you won't find anything with that kind of identity, so I'll relax the identity a little bit and filter it, and then you'll see, obviously, a few more, right, a few more, and then, of course, I can say e-value, you know, e-value of... You can change the E value, and I can say E to the, only E to the negative 100 to E to the negative 115, and you will filter it that way. So that's, that's not what it likes, but there's another way in which you can do it. Uh, And if I filter it like this, you'll only get one of those with that high, that, that's our top, top, right? Uh, you can also change coverage, uh, uh, the query coverage. Let's go back to our original. And you can also change your plus search. So, um, and I can go back to my original search. And now what you can do is I can also go from the query coverage. I can go from query coverage and I can sort it based on query coverage. So I have the highest scores, the low, lowest scores. So basically as a default, you know, the percentage identity, I can, I can sort it. If I click on the percentage identity, it sorts it based on percentage identity. So the 94% is the highest, right down to 71%, okay? So you can do all kinds of interesting things here, okay? So this gives you kind of a kind of a thumbnail thumbnail notion of how to do a blast search. Okay, so that is that is blast. Now this is an interesting interesting table. It's uh, like, remember now if you ask yourself what exactly you know when you run a blast search, you're not exactly specifying your you know your gap opening penalty or you know the gap extension penalty. And so, so now you have your all your searches, right? And this kind of gives you an idea of what exactly is, what exactly do they adopt? So what is the gap opening penalty, right? What is the, um, so what is the expectation value? What is the default cutoff of expectation value? If an expectation value is 10, which compared to the results we looked at is actually pretty bad, it would say that, you know, okay, anything below 10, we cannot validate that there was any kind of statistical strength to that match not being there at random. Okay, so you can take a look at this. So now what happens is you have your your um, your sequences, right, that you're trying to align, but now if you can put it in perspective of the things that you learned at a at a scale down at a scale down level. Okay. Now <coughs> once we look at the next um, at the next uh, next lecture, you'll see that we are going to look at um, what is called the, the genome browser. I mean, just, a, just a short introduction to the genome browser with, with kind of links and things like that, uh, you know, to YouTube videos which tells you how to get started. Now, the, the UCSC genome browser created its own version of, of BLAST called BLAST, and it basically is a is a more dedicated version. So BLAST is a alignment tool like BLAT, so it's like almost like B-L-A-T is a BLAST-like 
alignment to, but rather than take your sequence and run it up and down against the entire archive that is the GenBank archive, it actually does something a little different, and this is the difference, okay? So BLAT is an alignment tool like BLAST, which is exactly what its acronym is. It's not really an acronym, it's more an abbreviation is BLAST-like alignment tool, but it's structured differently. For DNA, BLAT keeps working up, it takes an, an index, it takes the entire genome, so this is basically just purely genome, so you're going to be very restricted to the genomes that have been identified the entire genome in memory, and it keeps an index, okay? So it's not all GenBank sequences, but it creates an index. It's like a word index. It's like a, it's like a Google search. What does Google search do? It basically, or any search engine, it basically creates an index of words. So rather than say, I'm going to go through all 50 trillion web pages and find the results, no, it does an index, right? It's like this. You're reading a book, and you want to find a particular word or a particular author or a particular concept or a particular idea, you go back to the index, you look at it, and that index will lead you exactly to the web, to the page way in, in the book. So that's basically how it is, right? So, so what you're doing is, so you take all non-overlapping, it takes your entire genome and basically breaks it into 11 rows, okay? So it breaks it into smaller words like an index. And then what happens is it gives you the results based on, based on that, oh, I found this little piece uh, of, 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 of 11 nucleotides long, and I'm going to give you the results because of that, that match, okay? So basically what happens is, because now it's a more dedicated, uh, kind of like a, like a search engine type of a methodology, you can get your results a lot quicker. However, uh, you know, the, but it's a little less, it's less comprehensive than BLAST, but for most people, you know, it's like, okay, I'm interested in this associated with that particular genome, and I'm going to find so when we look at that, you realize that these are the same people, the genome.ucsc.edu, these are the same people who created a really popular genome browser. There's other genome browsers, for example, the, the um, uh, European Bioinformatics Institute has, uh, has their genome browser, GenBank has its own genome browser, but this is the one that's the most popular. All right, so the BLAST is a basic local alignment search tool which finds regions of local similarity among nucleotides and DNA sequences. Okay, so basically, and, and again, the, the genome browser, we look at the ensemble genome browser, uh, statistical significance of matches from ensemble release uses NCBI BLAST for its search options. So ensemble uses BLAST from NCBI. And then you have the other, uh, the other contrast between uh, BLAT is a sequence alignment tool similar to BLAST, but structured differently. It finds similarity from, from that indexing methodology, but it needs an exact or near exact match to find it. So if it finds a sequence and it, uh, you know, it basically it, it goes to the indices of, of, of those 11 MERS and it says, oh, the, that 11 MER is a match, a strong, good match, almost perfect match, and therefore that is, therefore the sequence from which that index came, for example, that, that page from which that word came, if you wanted to use the, use the analogy of a book or a search engine, is a result that you get and you get it really quickly. Now let's go into, and I think one of you really, in a very clever way, did, uh, did the homework using these matrices. It wasn't called for, but, uh, but this is the, um, uh, these are the matrices that you want to use, and they're called the Blossom and the Pan matrix, okay? The point uh, mutation matrix and the, and the block substitution matrix, so we'll see what that is. So you see the Blossom matrix and the point, the Pan PAM matrix, and so we'll see what those matrices are in the sense that, in the sense that they, it identifies a particular score for an amino acid being replaced by another amino acid, okay? And that is a score which is then incorporated into an alignment matrix, and that's the final score you got. Now, remember that uh, we, we jumped up, uh, we jumped, we jumped a little ahead uh, when, when I showed you how to do that alignment with the gap penalties and things like that for this, uh, for the sequence. Okay. Remember this sequence, this is where we use the blossom, uh, blossom to, to do the, the alignment score. And, and, uh, and I said, well, I wanted to show you about alignments and gaps and and gap opening penalties and gap extension penalties, and because I wanted to show you that, we had to jump a little ahead because this was a really great example, and so we will now go back. 
to to what we are looking at right now. And so so there you go. Okay, so the substitution matrices to score alignment, there's two, there's a Blossom matrix and Pam matrix, and they're kind of the, 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 the fundamental idea is still the same in terms of the comparison. How do they come up with those scores is slightly different. And so you can see both favorites, the, the Pam was initial and Blossom was was a little was a little later. Both of them, you know, were were basically are, are really great, and a lot of resources allow you um, allow you um, uh, good good solid results. Okay. All right. So let's look at the Bl Blossom matrix. What does the Blossom matrix do? So how does how does one come up come up with those those numbers? Right. How you saw that alignment. You put all the amino acids on the rows. All the, on the column, and then you see how those each of those align. Okay, so in a Blossom matrix, you what you do is you take a group of a group of proteins. Okay, they might or might not belong to the same family, and so that's the block. It's the block of it's a block of proteins. Okay, uh, and then it is identified by the sequence similarities. Okay, uh, no gaps when that block has a known sequence similarity across that across that block of R, and that's that Blossom, that's that Blossom R, that Blossom 62, for example. Then for each of the 20 amino acids, they calculate the log odd ratio. This means that the database of the, the database of those, that block of protein tested, you say, okay, here is an amino acid. What are the chances of it being replaced by another amino acid, right? And, 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 and that's what's called the log odd, that's, that's the, the way to, the way to um, so what are the chances of it of in that same protein block being having the same amino acid or replaced by another amino acid? What are the probabilities? Okay, and that probability can be quantified using a log odd ratio, which we will study now. Okay, so the question therefore is what is the log odd ratio? So let's look at what an odd ratio is. Now let's look at an example. Okay, let's say you have um, an outbreak of a particular disease. Okay, and so this is the exposure. So let's say malaria, okay? Let's say you have a bunch of mosquitoes that basically are carrying the malaria virus as, as a vector, and they, so there's a swarm of those mosquitoes. So let's say a person is exposed and shows the, and gets malaria, okay? They are exposed and gets malaria, okay? That is A. Then the number of people who are exposed but don't get malaria is B. The people who are not exposed and get malaria is C. And the people who are not exposed and don't get malaria is D. So you calculate the odd ratio as a ratio of A times D, okay, A, divi a times D divided by B times C. So this, this is a pretty easy multiplication as you have. Right, so you have the exposed cases, that means people who are exposed and got the versus unexposed cases, which is C, and then you have exposed non-cases versus unexposed non-cases, okay? And so this is a pretty A, B, D, C, D. Now, the question is, we talk about the ratio, but what, I, I use the word the log odd ratio. So why, why do you come up with the log odd ratio? Okay, so let's take another example of this. Let's say you have, and this has just come straight out of Wikipedia, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a pretty useful illustration. Let's say there's 100 men, 90 drank wine the previous week, while in the sample of 100 women, only 20 drank wine in the same period, okay? So the odds of a man drinking wine are 90, 90 to 10 or 9 to 1, and the odds of women drinking wine is 20 to 8 or 8 to 10 or 2 to 8 or 1 to 4. Okay, so the log odd ratio is man drinking wine, women not drinking wine, is 9 over 0 0.1, so that's 9 times 0.8. Remember how I said this is the A, this is the D, this is the C, D, and this is the C, and you get 36. Okay, which means that the odd ratio of the men is, 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 of, of men drinking is 36 times. Now, what happens typically is when you have when you have numbers that are really big, like 
based on based on 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 the way the 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 the, the log odd ratio or the or the symptoms or the number of exposed cases etc are put together the numbers become very big and therefore in order for us to kind of have some handle on that you take the national log okay of so for the national log of 36 to 1 the chances of a man drinking are 36 to 1 to a woman drinking are 36 to 1 and that, that basically gives you a number that's a little more a little more compatible okay and that is a little more not compatible it's a little more you get a number that you can you can kind of work with all right so the blossom 62 is that means that the blossom 62 is your nice little middle ground uh, value and that is because um, that is because um, if you when in doubt just use 62 because so what what does that 62 mean it means that when they took that block of proteins the the kind of the the internal sequence similarity was 62 percent and so then those numbers change so what happens is if you have if you have if you're trying to uh, you know uh, use the blossom to come up with numbers related to really dissimilar proteins then you will have a blossom matrix which is reflective of that like something with a low number on the other hand if you have very very highly you know highly similar sequences that you're trying to align then you would use uh, your again an alignment score then you would use the blossom 80 for example okay and so you will see here and this is a log odd ratio and we saw what that is and so you will see that these are the numbers obviously the chances of it, these are numbers are positive because the chances of it being replaced by themselves is pretty high right but then you have other numbers so then sometimes you look at now you always see cysteine is high cysteine is high because cysteine has um, you know because it's you know since if you look at it if you look at it from a structural uh, structural standpoint uh, you'll see that you know cysteines have have a kind of in from a three dimensional structural standpoint they, they don't just exist but they exist because they are they also um, have the disulfide bridge which has a significant role in in the three-dimensional structure and therefore the, the, there for, for cysteines to be conserved is really important and therefore these numbers are high. also tryptophan also is is a is a very unique amino acid it's a it's the only one which has a kind of a fused six member and a five member ring and that means it's also pretty bulky and therefore it's kind of hard to replace and something that's hard to replace is which means it has a high con conservation point and that's you know qualitatively speaking that is what those numbers mean now you remember this thing right we did this whole thing and you saw exactly why those scores were they they are you can go back to it and look at you know the gap the affine gap penalty but then for the actual scores you could just say I'm going to make up this number but when it comes to protein sequences you know that you know that you can you actually have solid numbers based on something like a blossom matrix so we saw this so just repeating this uh, this particular slide okay so what does the r stand for the percentage con convergence which is the which is the, uh, the similarity that's in that family of sequences that's been used okay so blow so when in doubt again use that middle of the road one you know so you've got a low blow high number like 80 low number like 45 if you really are confident using it because you kind of know what sequences and when you're when you're doing research you don't just want to go blindly you have some sense of the nature of the proteins you're working with right and so but if you've been in doubt 62 is what typically what people use okay um, if you have what is called a the point accepted mutation this is a, a slightly different one it was by Margaret Dayhoff and it came you know this it proceeded by approximately 15 years Blossom matrix. The blossom tends to be used more. So here's what happens. So you had 71 families of closely related proteins were used, and then you made a phylogenetic tree, and they identified this 1572 mutations, and then the sequence aligned it as long as it was 85% similarity up the phylogenetic tree, and then you had highly targeted mutations because in the in the phylogenetic tree you had anything that met the 85% similarity. Were, were retained in the phylogenetic tree, which means they are closely related families. And if they are closely related families, it's not just these divergent mutations all over the place. You can actually pinpoint, you can pinpoint these mutations. That's what the last bullet point says. You can pinpoint the mutation because they are, because they are sequentially very closely related. So that's the, 
these are the mutations. And based on that, you see that uh, there's what is called a mutability ratio, which is, uh, which is abbreviated M sub I, subscript I, and those are the numbers that you get. And similarly, based on that, you, you see, and you'll see that from that standpoint, even once again, the cysteine and the, and the tryptophan are, are pretty high. And the zeros are also important because the zeros, the zeros look like they're not probabilit probabilistically, they're not contributing much in terms of that particular, that particular um, uh, uh, mutation in, in a particular place. So they're called mutations as opposed to a substitution. And that's the fundamental philosophical difference between between LOSUM and PAM. Okay, scoring matrix like PAM can be used to score an alignment. Okay, so 250 would be a typical. So now if you look at it, they kind of go in the opposite direction. PAM 100, LOSUM 90. So high, okay, the high, the low PAM is corresponds to the high LOSUM and then the low uh, LOSUM corresponds to the high PAM. All right. Uh, so again, uh, when would you choose to use one versus the other? Uh, so 250 is the used for really distant sequences, and 80 is used for closely related sequences, and blossom general is PAM 120, the typical one. So PAM matrices are used as alignment between closely related proteins because, again, you know, the mutations were based on that 85% phylogen phylogeny, and we'll see what a phylogenetic tree is. So the Blossom matrix was used as for alignment, evolutionarily divergent protein sequences. It's based on global alignment. Now we know what that is, based on local alignment. Alignments have high similarity, and alignments have lower similarity than PAM. Mutations are very significant, based on highly conserved stretches of alignment. So it's kind of a local alignment. Big stretches of alignment have to be the same. Um, again, higher numbers in MAM means greater evolutionary distance, which means they're separated. Whereas high numbers in blossom means that they are close. Okay, that means they're very close evolutionarily. Okay, so that's the differences. Uh, and you have another, uh, you know, we'll tell you more about this. You can go to this website if you're interested in finding out a little bit. And then there you have something called multiple sequence alignment where you, you know, kind of do, they do a pairwise up and down from one to the other and then you can get a phylogenetic analysis based on that. So there are many tools that you can go. Tools that typically you have uh, what is called a two star W2 is what you have. You can also have, um, in addition to two star W, now you you can have you know three three uh, uh, sources like mega and muscle and, and, and things like that. So that's what multiple sequence alignment does. Okay. Okay. We we talked about eighty five percent of the of whatever group of sequences in the PAM matrix were were identified only with 85% similarity when they were really clustered around. So this way you realize that the that the mutations were were uh, were you know really consequential from an evolutionary standpoint. Okay, and those the log odd ratio of that was calculated. So now let's think a little bit about you know, you've probably seen or in, 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 in as part of your research performed phylogenetic analyses. And so this is, uh, this is this notion of phylogeny and cladistics, okay? So let's look at the definition of cladistics as we round out this particular, this particular class. So cladistics is a particular method of hypothesizing relationships among organisms, okay? That is, what is the relationships? Uh, how do how are they related? Uh, you know, and and so you know you always think of a phylogenetic tree, and the further you are away from the tree, which means your the, the your, your relationship is a lot more distant, right? And therefore you could see, for example, if you have the the great apes, will be very close to human, right? For example, we we um, share a large part of our genomes with chimpanzees. Okay, so. Cladistics is a way of organizing it so you get some sense of how distantly related uh, things are. And, 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 and again, you know, once we, once we get to the discussion of cladistics, we'll see how it contrasts with phylogeny. All right, so the second bullet point reads, the basic idea behind cladistics is that members of a group share a common evolutionary history and are closely related more than another group which is kind of further away in the what is called a cladogram. These groups are recognized by sharing unique features which are not present in distant ancestors. These shared derived characteristics are called synapomorphies. Okay, all right, so let's take a look at it. 
So the assumption, cladistics makes certain assumptions, and one is that of homology, that they are related by descent from a common ancestor. Okay? And that's the first assumption for all evolutionary biology. It means that life rose on Earth only once, and every organism is related in one way or the other. Okay? There is a bifurcating pattern of cladogenesis. Okay? Cladogenesis. And that is that the organism may arise, so you, you know, one parent cannot give rise to three and four offspring, okay, in, in the cladogram. It is basically bifurcating. It's one going to two, then four, etc. And the changes in characteris characteristics occurs in lineages over time. And that's the third, that's the third um, uh, assumption. And, and you can see the last part of this description is that only when the characteristics change are we able to distinguish. It's a very phenotypic uh, way of looking at things, okay? Now, when you look at the cladograms, which is a cladistics organizations versus a phylogenetic analysis, so a cladistics is useful for creating a system of classification only. You see the breakdown. Cladistics predicts properties of organisms in the sense, as I said, it is is very phenotypic. You want to be able to take a look at it and say, oh, these are distantly related. For example, if you had no method of classification of any kind, and if you see a chimpanzee and a, and a bonobo, for example, or a human uh, gorilla, um, orangutan, versus a tiger, a lion, right, just from the physical phenotypic char characteristics, you would be able to classify them into groups. And for example, if you look at the great apes and then you look at man, it is the ability to walk comfortably on, on, two, on two feet, okay? So let's take a, and then cladistics helps you elucidate the mechanisms of evolution, and that's basically how you will see it. Now let's look at some definitions of clade, a group of organisms that arose from a common ancestor. So you have the monophyletic, okay? The monophyletic is therefore, for example, where you have the bifurcation that occurs where, where each of these arose from a uh, particular group and they're looking at the most common ancestors. So for example, for D and E, the most common ancestors is C and G and H is F and then C and F is B, okay? And what is a paraphyletic, uh, paraphyletic, um, uh, paraphyletic, I'm not saying it correctly, the paraphyletic uh, cladogram is one where where uh, it, it, you can go down this particular breakdown, and the, all the breakdowns are the same. You just have to see how they are organized, but they do not have to, uh, they not include the common ancestor of all the, of all the members, okay? That's a paraphyletic is one that where the most common ancestor, but not all the descendants. So you basically go up kind of one branch, okay? You grow up one branch like this, but not all the descendants are included in the paraphyletic in a paraphyletic cladogram. And a polyphyletic taxon is defined that does not include the common answer of all members in the taxon, and you can see that here. So for, for example, E and G are polyphyletic because when you compare those two, when you put those two together evolutionarily, you don't really concern yourself with the, with the ancestor in the sense that these two ancestors are different, okay? So there's different ways of looking at it. So there's uh, also one you can look at as a monophyletic, okay? And then the entire thing is also monophyletic, right? Now, so for example, if you look at the primate cladogram, you have lemurs, lorises, tarsis, new world monkeys, old world monkeys, apes, and now you get closer to the humans. And lemurs and lorises also belong to the same, but you can see just in case of you put a lemur and a loris, you know, the big eyes, because they are nocturnal, to be, be able to absorb the most light. If you look at them, they are further away from humans, and that the classification is very phenotypic. All right, now what's a primate phylogenetic tree, for example? You will see the same breakdown. The, only, the one difference between the cladogram is in the cladogram, you're just concerned with how the, how the physical attributes are, the physical attributes are separated, um, you know, and, and, and that's how you see that particular breakdown. And the evolutionary, evolutionary breakdown is also correct. In a phylogenetic tree, in a phylogeny, you are looking not only at the breakdown, but look at the x-axis here, you are looking at the timeline, okay? So you will be able to, you will be able to see this break, uh, you will see this, able to see this break 
in terms of time. If you say, oh, looks like this bifurcation occurred a million years ago, right? And then this bifurcation is relatively like 10 million years ago. And, and so that's, so you add, you add a, uh, you add a timeline to a cladogram and then it becomes a phylogeny. Okay? So a phylogenetic tree, an evolutionary tree, represent evolutionary relationships among a set of organisms, group of organisms called a taxa. The tips of the tree represent the descendant and then the nodes represent the original parent. Two descendants that split from the same node are called sisters, right? So in, in for example, if you look in this, you'll see that A and B are sister groups. And then, very often the terms are used interchangeably. What's the difference between a phylogeny and a, clar uh, and a cladogram and its branches? Uh, but strictly, uh, the lengths of the branches do not mean much in evolution. They're merely connections, okay? Um, and so if you go back and, and look at the cladogram, you say, well, what does it mean in terms of this breakdown versus this breakdown? Does it have anything to do with time? And you would you would say it's not okay. Now, the um, with phylogenies, the length of the branches actually are mean the time, the time for that break to occur. Okay, uh, and then and then further bifurcation into daughter. So some sometimes in an evolution, let me see this one. You will see, for example, that here you have a lot of diversity. Here you have a little less little less diversity. So the time actually means the time actually means something. All right. So for example, if you look at this, the great apes, the pygmy chimpanzee, the common chimpanzee, to human, to gorilla, to orangutan, you'll see where the break occurs between gor gorilla, gorilla, and orangutan. But again, you'll tell you exactly between, you know, it's for example, the pygmy chimp diverse uh, evolutionarily moved away from the common chimpanzee at around maybe I don't know, approximately 2.5 million years. And so these are the numbers which are also responsible to, for the phylogeny. And again, once again, the primary difference is the time. Okay. All right. So now I, I saw this very interesting, very interesting picture. It's a really old, almost like it's a hand-drawn, hand-drawn uh, uh, thing of of of, the, uh, of vertebrates. And you will see that there are all these different eras. You know the. The new era, the modern man, the Eocene, the Neocene, the Pliocene, the Cretaceous, the Jurassic, the Triassic, okay? Uh, and so you, very interesting, if, uh, and again, you know, there's no way to really quantify this, but just to round out this particular discussion, I thought it would be a good idea to, to introduce just this, this little picture. It's kind of a really old, it's a really old, it's an evolution of man. And so... <coughs> it's, it's very interesting to see how this works. So you've got the protozoans, assuming that's the real common ancestor, right, in the Archaea. But I'm trying to see where the, that, where the invertebrates broke off. Now, invertebrates are still in existence, right? The entire nine pile of invertebrates are still in existence. So what you see is that there was the area of the fish and almost nothing which ended up being mammals. And then the fish kind of reduced, right? The fish reduced and then the amphibians took over, and then the amphibians took over during the Cretaceous Jurassic period, the number of fish that is the, the water dwelling, the aquatic kind of stayed the same beyond it, but then the reptiles took over. And now it seems to be we are running in the age of mammals. However, if you, again, there's no way to really quantify this, I just thought it was an interesting picture. If you look at it, you look at, at this picture, one of the, and there, there are many conclusions that you can draw for it, one is, you know, in, in terms of the vertebrates, it's like the, this, uh, the, the earth can only support these many that, uh, you know, if, if one expands and then reduces and another expands, it's, it's at the cost of one. So, for example, now we are in the age of mammals, which means the number of reptiles, the birds, the amphibia, etc., amphibians and the fish have kind of, you know, those numbers have, have, have plateaued out. Okay, again doesn't mean much, don't see more into it. I just thought it would be a nice way to, to round out this particular, this particular discussion, okay? All right, that's the end of that. I'm going to upload this really soon. You'll have another homework, and then I'll try, and during this week, I will start on the, on the genomics um, side of things, okay? All right. Um, um, I hope
hope this has been enlightened, enlightening. I hope this has been a good introduction to classical bioinformatics before we get into the special topics and the, the other thing that is more um, uh, kind of more topical, and that is the uh, the uh, bioinformatics as it relates to genomics and bioinformatics of the genome. Okay, and the 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 obvious thing is next generation sequencing.